السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ومن والاه My dear respected brothers and sisters, my dear respected scholars and leaders, thank you so much. I learned so much from uh, our brothers and sisters who just uh, spoke and shared their experiences. And let me tell you something personal for me. I am a Palestinian Muslim American. And I appreciate the solidarity I have been seeing from all people, from all walks of life, including all Muslims in this country and around the world. I appreciate and really applaud the young people, all of you, who just by wearing a Palestinian kufiya, and you are not a Palestinian, that is a sign of commitment and a sign of solidarity that is sending a profound message, not only to the Palestinian people, that they are not alone in their fight for justice, equality, and freedom in Palestine, but they are not alone because their culture, their symbol of nationalism and love for freedom and their country is shared around the world. So I, as a Palestinian, on behalf of my people, both in the refugee camps in the West Bank and Gaza, all over the world. May Allah bless you. Thank you so much for this sign of solidarity and this courage and commitment. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we are speaking about dismantling systems of injustice. The most clear example that we can look at is the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. From the example, example and many examples that we learned from the history and seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In a nutshell, with the help of Allah, with the guidance of the Quran, and with the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, being a normal human being who was an orphan who was a son and a grandson and the son of a tribe that left all and many values of equality and justice. He was born into a system that deviated from the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was born and raised in a system that did not honor people the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored them. He was brought up in a system where people denigrate and discriminate against women and against child, girl, child, girl, girl, girl uh, newborn. He was born and raised in a system that was so deeply off the chart, so to speak. And yes, they recognized that Allah exists, but they refused to submit to the will of Allah and give up certain traditions that they were brought on. That resistance was really the struggle of the Prophet ﷺ. He did not have miracles that were comprehensible to people, except he lived with them, he ate with them, and he, at one point, he was declared as a Sadiq al-Ameen. But when he started to confront the state, the system around him, they started to smear him, and denigrate him, and backbite him, and accuse him of being a magician, of being someone who's been taught to undermine the system of Quraysh. His honesty, his reputation was out the window. When he stood up on his values, on his faith, and he confronted, and he was confronted. He was boycotted. He was isolated. His companions 
were tortured to death. Bilal is one example that if we focus on, we see the journey of struggle, empowerment, but also embracement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And down in the Sira, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated to Medina, he continued to face the system. Brothers and sisters, it showed that the Prophet Sallallahu long journey of 23 years was slow progress that included victories and defeats. And it tells us that change does not happen over time, does not take place overnight. It takes time, it takes patience, it takes hard work, believe in Allah and trust in Him. And this process does not change our values, even if we feel outnumbered, if we feel that we are overwhelmed by the injustice, by the animosity, by the ignorance, by the deliberate attempt to undermine us, we do not and should not be discouraged. Why am I saying that? Look at the history and struggle of African Americans in this country hundreds of years, from slavery into segregation, into Jim Crow, into discrimination everywhere in our, in our society, into br police brutality. It's a long journey of struggle. Because of that struggle, from then until now, we as Muslims, especially immigrant Muslims, we should acknowledge and recognize the sacrifice and sweat and tears of our African-American brothers and sisters in this country, especially the Muslim brothers and sisters. And our struggle has been intertwined and interconnected. I, as a founder of CARE, the largest Muslim civil rights and advocacy organization in this country, I tell you and I acknowledge that CARE's work is in the footsteps of leaders of the African-American Muslim community. I declare that CARE is a sadaqa jariya, a continuous charity for Malcolm X. I was inspired by the legacy of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, but mainly from the African-American Muslim brothers and sisters who preserved Islam for you and me to stand here and enjoy our rights. Our community, mainly the immigrant community, the offspring of the American Muslim community, should completely look deep in our hearts, in our attitudes, in our conduct, in our day-to-day -day business, and show appreciation for our African-American Muslim community, and make sure that the inclusion, the diversity, is not only tolerated, but uphold, upheld and promoted and lived and fought for. And definitely, if we want to fight discrimination and Islamophobia and racism, we have to fight and have zero tolerance of anti-black racism within the American Muslim community. Take this message at home, not only to the mosque and schools. Practice this at home and celebrate our ummah, our diversity, our strength that supersedes over any other community in the United States and around the world. We don't tolerate diversity. We uphold diversity. We believe in diversity. It is a matter of faith as Muslims. And now speaking in the few remaining moments, where do we go from here? What's the plan for the American Muslim community? We are an affluent community. We are an educated Muslim community. We have the freedom, although this freedom and these rights are always challenged by Islamophobes. I tell you, brothers and sisters, we don't want only to succeed as Americans, 
But we have to succeed in this country as American Muslims who love their faith and would like to practice it in every aspect of life. And if we do not feel safe and secure about our faith, we will not succeed as American Muslims. And that's why the first step is to understand our rights, hold dearly to them, defend them, protect them, understand them, and report them and fight back. We can do that through the work of care. We have 35 offices nationwide. These offices are there for you to provide you political, social, and legal representation free of charge if you or your loved ones or people you know happen to be victims of discrimination on or, or Islamophobia, whether in the workplace, in the school system, in community places, or in even, even in government agencies. If you are in a city where there is a care chapter, connect with them. If you do not have a care chapter, think about creating a chapter. Because without a civil rights organization that protects and defends the rights of Muslims, the future of the Muslim community in that city or state is, in, is, 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 is shakeable. That's number one. Number two, the essence of standing up for justice in Islam is really a personal conviction, as my dear brothers and sisters explained. Don't wait for the community or institutions to step in. You have to step in because it is a matter of faith for you to show up. And as I was trained many years ago, be a committee of one. Be a committee of one. Don't wait for others to take action. It's your, it's your responsibility. And the Prophet ﷺ instructed you, all of us, individually, when you see something, say something. When you see evil, stand up and change it with your hand if you can. If you cannot, seriously, then with your tongue, speak out against it. Organize against it. Use your social media. Don't only be on social media. Be in the streets. Be everywhere where injustice has to be confronted. If you do not have that power, never normalize injustice and coexist with it, which is deny it with your heart. And that's the least of faith. But we as Muslims, we have bigger and deeper faith. So we should move up to step one and step two, which is to take action against it. Working through institutions is the way towards the future is to work as a community, an organized community. But I would like, sisters and brothers, in the next, in the next few moments, to give you a, ho a homework. Are you ready for it? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having a problem with my ears. Are you ready for a homework? Okay. The first phase is stay engaged. Continue to speak about Palestine. Continue to speak about any injustice. Don't give up. Don't sit on your hand. Don't feel outnumbered. Allah's victory is coming. But you have to show up. Organizing for Palestine in the past 10 months has shown that the Muslim community and our allies from other faith and non-faith communities is working. We have accomplished a lot. Hundreds of thousands of people in the streets everywhere, including in Washington, D.C. We have helped shift the public opinion to see that the victims are the Palestinians, that the brutal occupation should be called out, that our government is doing this in our name with our tax dollars with our silence, with our ineffectiveness sometimes, and they should be called out. And that's why President Biden was unseated. He was unseated with your work, with your voices, in the streets, everywhere. He was unseated by the uncommitted movement, by the abandoned Biden movement. That's progress. The message was there. And no one can deny it. 
Well, Kamala Harris stepped in. But have we seen more than change of slight tone? That's not enough. What she's doing may be in the right direction, but not in the right speed. And we're not hearing enough from here to deserve what we can give and offer. So keep the pressure. We have a couple of months. Keep the pressure because we're not about changing the tone. We are about changing radically the policy that promotes and helps and arms and finances the victimizer and dehumanizes the victim of this conflict or this occupation. We'll delete the word conflict. It's a brutal occupation. So brothers and sisters, Palestine is not a foreign policy issue. It is an American domestic issue. We should make sure that it is present in the city council resolutions, in the state legislation and the federal legislation. Everywhere Palestine should be present because it is our cause today for the Muslim Ummah and for humanity. It is our test and we should not fail the test. That's for now, for the longer term. I have to be frank with you. The Muslim community is overrepresented in technology, in IT, in medicine, in engineering, alhamdulillah. The Muslim community is overrepresented in businesses. But brothers and sisters, the Muslim community is underrepresented in the media, in the legal profession, in filmmaking, in political science and in history teaching in the United States. Because of this, the image of Islam has been under attack for generations. It has led to Islamophobia, not only in the attitudes of people, but in policies of our government at home and abroad. Look at the relationship between America and the, and, and, and the Muslim world. It is not in the right place. Well. The Muslim world has divine values that match with our American values. But there is a disconnect. In fact, there is a conflict. This conflict is driven scientifically and deliberately between America and the Muslim world. We cannot excuse ourselves. We have been missing from this equation. And American Muslims have to step in and change that relationship. But we cannot do it only by being in the streets. We have to be in the halls of Congress. We have to be in the newsrooms. We have to be in the classrooms. We have to be in the books. And we have to be in the courts and in the courts of public opinion. To do that, we have to be organized. And we have to be good planners. Because this is really the essence of our faith. So here's the homework. We have 4,000 mosques nationwide. I urge every mosque and take this message to your board of directors of the mosques and your imams. Every mosque should have a special fund for scholarship, five scholarships every year. One scholarship for journalism, another one for filmmaking, a third one for law, a fourth one for political science, a fifth one for history and humanities. If we start in 2025, four years from now, we are going to have how many? 4,000 new attorneys for the Muslim community, 4,000 new filmmakers, 4,000 journalists, 4,000 students of political science, and 4,000 potential teachers of history. In 15 years from now, if we are persistent, we will end up with 50,000 more attorneys for the Muslim community, 50,000 journalists, 50,000 filmmakers, 50,000 political commentators, and 50,000 teachers of history and humanity. And therefore, we can tell our story about Islam. 
we can represent and defend not only American Muslims, but every person who needs our help because that's how we stand up for justice. And these lawyers most likely are the most qualified people to run for office because they are lawmakers. Lawmaking is about making laws. Today, we have 43 state delegates in the United States who are Muslim. If they want to run for Congress in the next two or four or six years, they can. We may end up, if we are organized, we may end up with about 50 members of Congress in the next six years if we only plan and put our money where our mouth and our minds are. So brothers and sisters, there you go. We as a community need to grow vertically, not just horizontally. We need not just to expand more mosques here and there when we can expand our future and our political influence here at home to make sure that America lives up to its principles, to fight injustice against people of color, and to fight injustice around the globe. And that's really the essence of dismantling the system of injustice, is to replace it with the people of goodwill, with the people who represent the Prophet Sallallahu being a mercy to mankind. I ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala to make us among those who follow the guidance and hear it, believe it, and implement it. So as you go home, be a committee of one. Don't wait for institutions to act. Take action. Be the inspiration. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring you individually. Be ready to answer. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help us to help not only the people of Palestine, but the people of India, the people of Kashmir, the people of Yemen, the people of Syria. And here, our people in their broken neighborhoods, in the jail system, in the school system, people who are in the streets looking for guidance, for help, for the mercy of people. We have a lot of work to do, and inshallah, a lot of re reward to gain. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.